So, um, good afternoon. Uh, much of Mats, m much of our work, Mats and mine, has centered around this uh, uh, PAM instrument, pulse amplitude modulated fluorometry, and we were reminiscing about what we've done during the last tw 22 years. So here goes. Uh, the first thing we did, we bought one of the first, I think we bought uh, serial number two of uh, this instrument. And the first things we did was to study corals, actually. And uh, you can see a coral head here, which, has, uh, which receives different light intensities from up to the side and downwards. And we tried to make these rapid light curves. And they came out pretty well and represented what we know about highlight plants, low light plants, and in between plants. And uh, we tried then to calculate ETRs versus the irradiance and found it very hard actually to get to real ETR values. And we had to do always then with relative ETRs. So the first question actually we, we, we thought about is how can we quantify uh, these electron transport rates, not to be relative, but to be true rates. And what do I mean with how can we quanti quantify? Well, how can we make sure that four moles of electrons will be the result of one oxygen split out of water? In other words, to quantify it, we should expect an oxygen to electron transport rate ratio a molar oxygen to electron transport ratio of 0.25. And uh, just a few words of how to calculate these electron transport rates. Well, this is, the tra this is the quantum yield, and that's given by the instrument, so you don't have to do a lot with that. Then you have to multiply it with the absorbed par, absorbed light. And again, it's easy to measure the incident light with a light meter, but you have to multiply it with an absorption factor. And then there's this 0.5 factor that has to be taken into account. And I will start with showing you a very simple way to estimate absorption factors. And you can use them in this calculation of true ETRs. It works sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. So let's take the example of our favorite seagrass in this uh, conference here, Halophila ovalis. You pick out a Halophila ovalis leaf from a typical meadow, a typical leaf from a typical meadow. And uh, first, you can measure the light with a light sensor slightly underwater in the petri dish or in the sea. And uh, then you put the leaf on top of the light meter and you calculate the absorption factor very simply here by how much light was absorbed by this leaf. And if you do that with Halophila ovalis, you actually get an oxygen to ETR ratio that's 0.28, and you get fairly linear response up to very high, up to half of uh, full sunlight, as you can see here. Now, that's not true for all seagrasses, and we have many exceptions. Uh, Halophila stipulatia has a very low oxygen to ETR value if you do this because you, it's very hard to calculate the absorption light. We think that that's the reason. And uh, other plants like Halophila righti has a much higher value than this. So the lesson we can learn from this is that there can be a linear and uh, quantitative correlation between photosynthetic oxygen evolution and electron transport measured this way by calculating the, uh, the absorption value in this very, very simple fashion. But that's not always true. And very often, it can be higher or lower than the 0.25 molar ratio expected. And also, very often, these curves, they kind of taper off at high light intensities because of photorespiration or other uh, things that uh, electrons will reduce except CO2. Um, now, let's look at this 0.5 factor. We call it the F2 factor. This is a relation between photosystem 1 and photosystem 2, and it's assumed to be 0.5. 
So as much light is absorbed by photosynthetic pigments of photosystem one as they are of, of photosystem two. Now that is a little tricky. Uh, I'll show you an example. We have halophila stipulatia here in Elat at 48 meters depth limit. And down here at this depth, uh, you can see that not only is uh, the light highly, at highly attenuated, but it's shifted towards the blue spectrum. And uh, what we did is to measure, first of all, chlorophyll A to B. Chlorophyll, chlorophylls are much higher both chlorophyll A and B at that depth, but the chlorophyll A to B ratio doesn't change much. What does change is the relation between photosystem two and photosystem one. And uh, I won't go into, into detail here, but this graph here tells us that photosystem one is three times higher at that depth than photosystem uh, two. And that means that this 0.5 factor will not be correct. There isn't an equal distribution of light absorption between photosystem two and photosystem one, but rather um, there's a big difference. So at one meter's depth, this factor is 0.62, and at 48 meters depth, it's 0.31. Now, if we would have done a rapid light curve using the 0.5 factor, then the difference between one and 48 meters would look like this. But if we do a rapid light curve with ETR versus uh, irradiance, taking these other 0.5, in quotes, factors into account, which we call now F2 factors, then you can see that the curves or the differences between the high light and low light plant are quite different. So the lesson we learned from this is, yes, 0.5 is OK to put in this electron transport formula, but it can be higher in shallow plants, shallow growing plants, and it can be lower in deep growing plants. It's quite complicated to get to the true uh, ratio between photosystem two and so photosystem one, but this is something you should think about. And if you think that there's a big difference here, you'd better go with relative ETRs than true ETRs. How good are these rapid light curves? Well, I'll give you two examples, two good examples. Uh, so this is a rapid light curve done on Halophila stipulatia growing at three or three meters depth or something like that. Uh, this, these curves are generated within a minute or two. And then we compared them to the actual point measurements of ETR at during uh, this irradiance in the morning and this irradiance during midday. And you can see that the pretty, there's a pretty good fit. So you can use these rapid light curves to predict the photosynthetic response to light at a certain depth. That works fairly well. And so this is for halophila stipulatia, and this is for Simodosia nodosa. And those little boxes here, if you want afterwards, I can give you these papers. I can give you PDFs of all these papers if you're interested. The lesson we learned here is that these rapid light curves can reflect in situ point measurements, uh, especially in thin-leaved sea grasses, such as these halophilas. Halophila ovalis would probably behave the same way as halophila stipulatia if these rapid light curves are started immediately after applying a dark leaf clip so you don't dark adapt them first and then start the light curve. Uh, what else have we learned during these 20 years of using the PAM fluorometer? Well, a whole bunch of things. I'll focus on two of them. The influence of chloroplast clumping on uh, these uh, absorption factors and uh, another one that I'll come to in, two s in, in one slide ahead. So halophila stipulatia, just like other halophilas, we'll hear from Pim Chanuk in a while. Uh, what they do is they clump together chloroplast at very high light, and this is some kind of protection, I think, from high light. Uh, while in dim light, like in the morning and the afternoon, or at depth, uh, they spread the chloroplasts out. So they become much darker when the chloroplasts are spread out. And when they're clumped together, light goes through and they look much paler. So this and this leaf have exactly the same chlorophyll content. It's only that the chloroplasts are clumped together here rather than here. 
And uh, you can see quite different absorption values. And of course, this will absorb more light than this. And so the correct absorption factor in this case would be 0.56. And in this, in this case, almost half of that. So that's something to think about for those that work on halophilas and want to go get true ETRs. You have to take into account the absorption of the leaf at the time that you do the measurement. High light leaves, lower absorption, low light leaves, higher absorption. Another thing that I think is quite remarkable, we used to work with oxygen electrodes, meaning that you had to excise the leaves, take them to the lab, put them in an oxygen electrode chamber, and we came to the conclusion by these experiments that seagrasses were carbon limited in today's carbon environment. When we did these works with the PAM fluorometer on in situ plants, we came to completely different um, results. And as you can see in the, plan, in the PAM fluorometer in situ, we get saturation long before we reach the 2.2 millimolar of inorganic carbon in seawater. And the conclusion here was then, it changed the dogma that seagrasses are carbon limited, that they are not carbon limited at all, many of them. Uh, they have good CO2 concentrating systems and they are saturated at today's CO2 concentration. The very last thing I want to point out here is uh, recent suggestions that this FB over FM value for maximum quantum yield, like uh, measuring any stress that has nothing to do with light because you do it in darkness, uh, may not be the west best way to express stress in seagrasses. And this is work that came out of Matt's lab, where you can see that the difference uh, in FB over FM here in a young versus an old leaf is very small. But if you instead measure FV over F0, you get a much more sensitive way to measure uh, stress. We can discuss this in the workshop. Um, my conclusion here is that FV over F0 may be a better or more sensitive proxy for plant health than FV over FM. Uh, so you can learn more about this either by uh, we're describing plant fluorometry as a method as compared to gas exchange me methods in this book. And we are also uh, going to discuss this in workshop number nine that Mats and I will uh, lead because Ron John Runcy couldn't come. He was supposed to do uh, this workshop. And so if you want to learn more, if you want to know more, if you want some input, if you want to discuss these things, it's a, it'll be the first day will be a discussion work group, the next day you'll do actual measurements, uh, uh, then please come to this uh, workshop, sign up for it if, if, if you want to, and if not, we have this book that came out a couple of years ago. And with this, I say thank you for listening. Peter. I was expecting that question, and especially, especially from you. And here is Mats who will answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Peter. Uh, most probably D1. D1 breakdown reflects in F0 much quicker, and it doesn't reflect very much at F0, uh, at FM at all. You have to have much more. So, so most probably the D1 turnover. Uh, and have you done work to... No, no. I, I stole this idea from the literature. It's not my idea. Uh, yeah. So this was done but it works. Yeah. It, it's nice. I had another slide, but I took it out. It, the, it was firstly described on terrestrial plants, but uh, Matze found this as, as a good measure. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have a question, um, not related, uh, related to uh, plants, actually. If I want to do PAM measurements on uh, something like a giant clam, for example, mm -hmm. how do you measure the absorbance? Like the light that is, I mean, you cannot, you know. With great <laughs> difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have devised a way to try to measure it in corals, and it has to do with absorbed versus reflected light back from the skeleton under the coral, but it's not very good. We're not there yet, no. 
Maybe Peter knows, I don't know. Uh, it, it doesn't work because the light's absorbed into the mantle. And so no matter what intensity of light you put into the plan, you're never going to get a measure. And it also closes and it distributes the accessibility everywhere. So I wouldn't hassle leave it alone. Or use relative ETR. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you.